Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm John Alterman, Senior Vice President, Vigna Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy, and Director of the Middle East Chair of Middle East Program at CSIS. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's seminar, which is inspired by a report we put out in May entitled Sustainable States, Environment, Governance, and the Future of the Middle East. For that report, we're grateful for the encouragement and support of the Embassy of the State of Qatar, Ambassador Sheikh Meshal bin Hamad Athani. And I also want to thank for today's event, the Ambassador of Jordan, Her Excellency Dina Kawar, for her help arranging today's program. Today's guest is a very special guest. And I have to say that as I read his five page biography, it seemed to me that even five pages didn't do him justice. His Royal Highness Prince Al Hassan bin Talal has been advisor to kings, an organizer and convener, and a humanitarian of the highest order. Much of his work has focused on human dignity, environmental sustainability, and youth. And as we think about the themes of the Sustainable States Report, what is the role of environmental sustainability? the delivery of services effectively and efficiently to broad populations. For some of the larger governance issues we see in the Middle East, we couldn't think of a better guest than His Royal Highness Prince Hassan bin Talal, who has been working on these issues for decades. So Your Royal Highness, welcome to CSS and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, I'm delighted to be with you. I'd just like to start, if I may, by saying that um, in terms of human um, dignity, I, I've always been um, attracted by the uh, acronym MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, versus MASS, Mutually Assured Survival. And this, of course, came to my notice in the context of uh, weapons of mass destruction. However, I would suggest that maybe as a point of departure, we should uh, focus not on the Anthropocene, but on the Humilocene. Um, a, a, a politician was once described as being a very humble man. And someone remarked, um, well, he's got a lot to be humble about. And <laughs> I don't mean that frivolously at all. I feel uh, the more misery that I see, the more systemic humiliation, the more ecocide, um, you know, the ecosphere says it all, it says what Daisako Ikeda, Ikeda uh, mentions, the Soka Gokai International. As we look uh, east to Japan from West Asia, he talks about value creation in a time of crisis. So um, I, I would like to suggest that ecocide is more than the environment. It's also people. And... Uh, uh, sharing our relations with our habitat and with each other, rather than cultivating hatred towards each other and polarity, uh, which is degrading our sociosphere, means also degrading our ability to think and to reflect our cogitosphere. And I find this extremely uh, worrying because of the new uh, terminologies that have appeared as a result of all of this which are tantamount to necropolitics, if you will, a phenomenon identified by the Cameroonian intellectual Joseph Akili Mbembe, who writes, in our contemporary world, various types of weapons are deployed in the interest of maximally destroying persons and creating death worlds. So my question to myself every morning is, are we really the living dead, or do we have something to contribute? to the improvement of uh, the sustainable development goals, which remarkably 17 uh, as they are, are still individual goals. We still talk about water individually from uh, human beings, that is to say migrants, uh, nationals, 
and refugees, as though each silo is meant to stay apart. But at the same time, the uh, climate um, uh, pressures, the climate imperative in a region where uh, we are living at least in the Arab Levant uh, with uh, uh, four other uh, countries, Arab countries, who are uh, uh, the most affected by water stress. I just wonder whether the World Resources Institute is not going to be uh, proven right. And when they go on talking about water and stress, they talk about the top 30 countries, uh, high levels of water stress by 2040 are in the region, including all six countries of the Levant. And let me add to that uh, uh, Israel, which obviously has to be extremely concerned. We started in 2010 with the Mumbai group in India. We can't talk to each other unless we bring an independent observer from another country and another region. And we started what was then the Montreux pro process. Uh, many of our members have uh, declined to participate or simply have been physically incapacitated because of internal war. And as you know, I live in a rough uh, neighborhood. And as I said to you earlier, an Israeli politician once said to me, we're surrounded by enemies. And I, I equipped uh, immediately saying, well, you think you have a problem? We're surrounded by friends. Well, actually, unless we can talk about uh, uh, shared commons, there is very little that we can present in terms of respect, mutual respect for each other's identity. And it is all about us and the others, isn't it? It's all about identity. And this is something that really worries me, that how can we move from talking about individual identities to uh, sharing water scarcity and, and, and the UNICEF statistics, for example, we're told that uh, the water sharing issue makes us the world's second water poorest country. And at the same time, of course, let me remind that school children are suffering from the effects of, uh, of climate change and pollution. We live between two of the most polluting areas in the world, uh, oil and uh, related energy on the one side and uh, the Mediterranean uh, and Israel on the other. We see a, a large black cloud over Amman every morning, every, every, every dawn. So my question to myself and, and to you and to your audience is, when and how can we move like the European Union from, in their case, a, a community of coal and steel, in our case, to a community of energy and water? I think the two have to complement each other, both in the context of the uh, Levant, the land of the rising sun. Descartes said, if everything in this world is west, where does the sun rise? And uh, of course, that applies to us and points east. But uh, uh, continuing from the, this uh, thought, I would like to suggest that uh, last month, the International Panel on Climate Change made it abundantly clear that even in the best case scenarios, the warming of the Earth's atmosphere at current rates is likely to exceed the threshold of two degrees, which means that this region, this Levant region, will become uninhabitable in decades rather than in centuries. So uh, the proposals that I would like to share with you uh, today are those relating to mutually assured survival. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make these introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot to, to chew on there. As somebody who has been deeply involved in Jordan's development plans, the five-year plans going back to the 1970s, what is the piece of the planning process that hasn't been there that needs to be there to meet the sorts of imperatives you're talking about? What needs to be baked in now that hasn't been baked in for the last 40 years? Oh, I could think of a number of points, among them cultural affinity, being able to talk to people in their own language, in their own idiom, in their own priorities. And uh, I go back to um, a born again peacemaker, um, Bob McNamara, when he came out to see us as the, the head of the World Bank, um, we were talking about enabling and empowering citizens 
But the fact is that in the last uh, um, decades, we've moved from 2.3 million people in my tiny country to 11 million people. And that's not because of uh, uh, anything other than the open door policy that we have had to refugees. And uh, of course, uh, Syrians alone, we are in uh, the order of over one and a half million Syrians. So I would say that Elm al in Arabic, ontological identity or ontological security has to illustrate the consequences of rapidly changing environments. In 67, it was people coming over from the West Bank, and that is, of course, up to a million uh, refugees. Uh, we had a social order to address, which went uh, through a bumpy ride in uh, 1771. But by the end of 71, we were uh, in the beginning of the 70s, literally on our knees. But what stood us in good stead was that we had a good track record. We were aiming for economic takeoff in 1970, were it not for that ghastly 1967 war. So I think that what we do not emphasize today, other, as Anthony Gidden has put, in it, put it very clearly, the pers a, a person's fundamental sen sense of safety in the world, which includes a basic trust of other people. We cannot relinquish our service of safety how much we however much we admire our, the ability of our military and security in the region as a whole, which is uh, the best put forward, particularly since 9-11. Everybody talks about security in terms of working against something. In this case, we have to work for something. And uh, <laughs> I'll quote Chiara Botici, uh, who elucidates, she says, in the light of the continual change in their present conditions, human beings are impelled to go back to their political narratives. Can we break out of Plato's gray cave? Can we break out of the political narratives? And can we look at uh, revising these narratives in the light of new needs and new exigencies? How much of what you're talking about is principally a domestic imperative and how much is an international imperative? What role Needs to, what role of that that human security piece needs to be delivered to Jordanians in Jordan, and what needs to come from outside Jordan? Well, uh, in terms of deliverables, I, I don't think that governments can do it without uh, the judiciary in Jordan, and uh, for that matter, the legislature. I certainly don't think they can do it without civil society. That is to say, to bring about a consensus of what has been called being in the world, in the world in which we live. Jordanians are with maybe up to a million in the diaspora, both in North and South America. And of course, uh, our relations with uh, the brain uh, drain vis-a-vis -vis, uh, as against the uh, brain gain. So I think that we are more specifically in, in a world where uh, we have to give greater uh, attention to talking to people, not talking down to them, but encouraging dialogue. And I think that the noble art of conversation is an art that has to be developed in Jordan. We have uh, a, a figure of uh, a million and a half Syrian re refugees, but uh, at the same time, we have 53 different nationalities who flock to Jordan as a result of regional wars. And I, I would like to say that cost, constructing an era, as uh, uh, the Buddhist Ikeda has put it, of human solidarity uh, means moving away from antagonistic security. My security begins within my, my banlieue, within my slum, within my suburb of uh, the big city in relative terms, Amman in this instance, to security from, and of course, the move towards collaborative security means, in my humble opinion, not working only uh, against crime, against narcotics, against the awful uh, uh, burden of a very young uh, population as seen by some. I see it as an opportunity. I see the kind of security that we have to work towards is in rehabilitating uh, people to uh, pursue their talent and their aptitudes. And in that sense, I just want to say that um, when the Europeans receive on their borders millions of refugees, 
they apply algorithmic weighting. So they uh, weight the uh, talents and aptitudes of the people coming in relation to the needs of their economy. It's a about time that we started weighting uh, uh, the uh, value, the human value of individuals uh, with their different talents. And uh, in that sense, I think uh, a professorial colleague of yours, Georgetown, Olofimi Taiwo, uh, is quoted here as uh, talking about the talent to produce by, but to hold for all. I mean, it's wonderful to talk about a young Jordanian who uh, sold his company for two and a half mil uh, mil uh, two hundred and five million dollars the other day, a startup. But how much has the startup uh, created in terms of uh, a, a beacon for others to follow? The rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and and this uh, polarity has to end. And this is why we are absolutely in need of empirical facts for the region. I don't know, John, if you realize or your listeners know that this region has no crisis prevention center. This region has no uh, uh, barometer uh, in terms of uh, West Africa. They have a regional development barometer. The, the Arab League is sleeping on the job. I'm sad to say and ESQA, the Economic and Social Commission, uh, is uh, focusing on projects rather than a regional vision for change. And in that context, I think we need, many yesterdays ago, an ECOSOC, an Economic and Social Council that meets at every month of the four months of the year, uh, every quarter, to develop our priorities. But of course, to do that, we have to speak to each other. President of Syria is in Moscow today. The King of Jordan is in the United States. We're all uh, flying after um, regulating our priorities in terms of our relations with others outside the region. We should be encouraged to talk to each other. Thank you. I want to remind our, our viewers that if you do have a question for His Royal Highness, there's a button on the web page. Uh, on the CSS webpage that you're viewing the event and you can send a question and it comes to us and, and we'll ask His Royal Highness. Um, in that, that, that sort of approach to changing the relationship with people, the poor getting poorer, what is the role of public utilities that governments provide in reshaping that conversation in, in in changing the relationship between governors, the, the governors and the governed, in creating patterns of trust, in creating patterns of honesty. I mean, where do you see public utilities, which people in public policy don't like to talk about, because as you say, everybody likes to fly around the world and go to conferences and, and, and talk about the great and the good. Where did this sort of daily issues of water, electricity, uh, sewer and waste disposal, where do those fit in to this equation that you're talking about? Well, I think there is an optimal um, uh, commitment to uh, uh, what, what the international community has described as beyond, beyond the uh, poverty line, below the poverty line, and the question of absolute hunger uh, of course, um, uh, is, is, is raised. But I just want to say, if you compare the Visegrad four countries, Poland, uh, so Slovakia, uh, Czechia, and Hungary, with the countries of the Levant, including Israel, you're talking about $38,000 per capita in their region. And this applies to Israel, of course, and it applies outside our immediate region to the Gulf states. And the best that we can achieve in this region is uh, short of $15,000, given the fact that we spend so much on our defense and on our services. And I personally think that the time has come to recognize that water policy, which is a continuing theme with the World Bank report, talks about ebb and flow. And we talk about ebb and flow in terms of uh, services without talking about um, the old uh, adage, um, the attracting population to urban centers and 
pushing deliberately into other regions of, uh, of, of the country. Uh, water deficit explained 10% of the increase in global migration between 1970 and 2000. So as we were sitting planning for ourselves, looking at the um, um, census figures, how many above and below the poverty line, we have found that in terms of water alone as a utility or public service, the climate change has induced 10 to 20% reduction in water supplies. And this impacts on Jordan's GDP by a negative 7%, on Iraq's GDP by 4%, Lebanon's by a negative 2%, and Syria's by a negative 10%. I have been calling for the creation of a land bank. I've been calling for the creation of a water bank, whereby people become stakeholders in their future. We are no longer talking down to them and telling them what their priorities should be, but uh, they should uh, take their future in their own hand, bearing in mind that man against nature is so unpretextable. And Syria has been a cautionary tale in this respect with over a million people who lost their livelihoods. And we tend to forget this point when drought precipitated the failure of crops in Syria between 2006 and 2011. Those who studied the wider Near East will remember that over a century ago, the mass exodus of people from the Eastern Mediterranean to, to the Americas came from uh, our part of the world. And in fact, Arabs are still referred to in certain Latin American countries as Turcos because they carried Turkish uh, travel documents. So it's a, it's a, a huge uh, task to address the subject of services versus development, but we have to move from a vulnerability-based approach, band-aid solutions, to a development approach, uh, even in micro terms, to um, develop the capabilities of our uh, embedded uh, energy, uh, uh, particularly among the young, and to invite them to participate in every possible uh, way in, in creating the stability that we that we see. And, and can I ask, what's the vehicle for that? Is it as individual citizens in, with relationship to the state? Is it on the municipal level with municipalities trying to organize and then bargain with the central government? Is it tribal? Is in Jordan, the tribes, as you know, have, have significant sway in, in, in many issues. What is, the, what is the vehicle by which individuals plug into institutions that serve their future, their destiny? I, I think that uh, in terms of um, local government and regionalization, um, these are only words on paper, unless we recognize that the basic three challenges that we uh, are facing are one, the um, question of governance, uh, which means that um, over 30% of our population under the age of 15, we simply have to begin with education and with the relevance of educational syllabus uh, to uh, development priorities and heritage priorities, understanding the past if you want to understand the present. Secondly, I think that uh, in terms of uh, a national census uh, of uh, um, or, 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 uh, opinion poll, it would be unreasonable to continue to say, um, given the polarity of the so-called opposition uh, of the Iraq, which is the, the young uh, today, call for reform, reform, reform. And I say, yes, but what kind of reform? I mean, I don't say it publicly because um, I'm, a, I'm a has-been, but I like to say, well, look where I has been. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I happened to be in 1968 on the on the bridge in Paris. And, and uh, actually I was going, crossing the bridge to um, uh, help a French friend who had been a paratrooper in uh, Algeria, uh, find a Dominican priest who would accept uh, that a Muslim could be the godfather to his son. So it is partly interfaith dialogue that I was trying to develop across the Seine. But uh, uh, I, I think that the, issue basically is that so many hateful issues have clubbed together 
the continued occupation of Palestinian lands, the whole issue of uh, uh, the, 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 the involvement in uh, the destruction of Baghdad and uh, Damascus and uh, Cairo in, 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 in the last um, a few decades, the main seats of caliphate, if you will, have been destroyed. There's a lot of pride in this part of the world, but uh, uh, it, is, it is misdirected in the sense that we have to get people down to basic issues. They can't only be aspiring politicians by talking about the glories of the past. The second issue, of course, is that I think uh, church-related organizations and uh, mosque-related organizations have to be uh, more aware of the priorities of uh, development and uh, human dignity. And in that sense, I think that they have uh, uh, to stop preaching from the pulpit only in terms of religious uh, narrative, but also have to pick up day-to-day -day issues. And lastly, I think that the rotating, as you mentioned, the tribes and, and, and the big families, uh, positional elites, as they've been described by one of the Misael Gamal, I wrote, wrote a wonderful book on the positional elites in Nasserite Egypt. And I think the time has come to, to recognize that the positional elites are not in step with uh, a, a regional uh, uh, dialogue with the result that such pursue, few uh, people, so few people turn up for elections, the percentage of participation in national election is pitifully low, and there's no indication of a pulse-driven uh, democratic process as yet. Can I ask you, the, the second one you described, the, the role of, of religious organizations in providing services and economic development, that's been one of the criticisms of Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, is these organizations <clears throat> have taken on a combination of religious roles, social and economic roles, and political roles. Is that something you think is basically good, but they should leave politics at the door? Or is there something about the whole enterprise that you think corrupts the enterprise? Well, I think that the second part of what you're saying is certainly true from the point of view of the uh, security establishment, uh, and for that matter, the judiciary. Of course, you have Sharia law, you have um, uh, civil law, you have tribal customary law, and you have humanitarian law, and it's very difficult to get them to see the, um, the, the nexus between uh, what is good in the, this proposed value system. But in terms of uh, the, um, I mentioned not only uh, Muslim or so-called Muslim uh, initiatives, uh, it's not what I intended when I referred to the church-related organizations. In, uh, the, in Palestine, for example, let's just say the territories and in uh, um, Israel 48, the Palestinians of 48, there is a big role for uh, uh, church-related organizations, of which we have at least 14 different uh, denominations in Eastern Christianity alone. And uh, I love the progression that they make. Um, um, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote a brilliant book called Looking East in Winter, in which he describes the values of Eastern Christianity as, uh, as uh, summarized by Olivier Clément, the philosopher of the last century. Personhood, we have to develop an insan al kulli, as we would say in terms of uh, a Muslim, the whole human being, the holistic approach, and liberty, which means that we have to de develop self discipline. Declaiming from the pulpit or from the mimbar is not a form of, of self discipline nor is it an invitation to work with other related disciplines, health, education, uh, uh, youth modeling, uh, and certainly not women uh, participating in the workforce. Uh, 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 women graduates of universities of 54% of our universities, but our women in the workforce are less than 2%. And this is absolutely outrageous. It, we can't continue to talk about quotas and women's rights uh, being pushed by pressure, pressure groups unless the attitude of society itself changes 
and they begin to they recognize the relevance of uh, this inclusive role. I, I want to go to audience questions momentarily, but but it does seem to me that that in a way what you're talking about is profoundly political, but it doesn't really have a political coloration. You don't talk about a a system into which a different kind of political relationship exists. How should we think about how this, this, this translates into politics and a political framework? I'd prefer to talk about uh, uh, policies which are absent uh, rather than politics which are all pervasive. Uh, and if you talk about uh, education reform, for example, you need at least a decade before you begin to see the, 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 the returns. If you talk about agricultural uh, land use um, in terms of the waste that there is at the present time, uh, in terms of uh, geography and geology, mining and different parts of the country, create, turning the country into a dust bowl. Uh, there are many issues that have to be addressed with a holistic view. If you talk about the Colorado River as a comparison or the Imperial Valley as a comparison with the Rift Valley, which runs through Jordan and is called the Jordan Rift Valley, this rift can only heal, as someone has put it, by a, an overall uh, view of better management. And in that sense, if at the peak of the Cold War, the Danube Camus Commission can manage uh, that mighty river, why is it that the regional commission cannot address the issues which are otherwise frittered away by politi futile political uh, discussions? I mean, one will never know whether the two canals being suggested for the Dead Sea have been uh, taken off the agenda for political reasons within countries and, and within their constituencies that uh, blatantly ignore the policy uh, drive that is needed to stabilize what is a major feature of our part of the world. I mean, we have a Danube Commission, a Mekong Commission, a Senegal Commission, with all these mighty rivers, even an Amazon commission, believe it or not. Why can we not uh, take policy, which is thematic, out of the political sphere? Because we have nothing better to do. All we do uh, is to talk politics, and until we enable and empower people to become stakeholders, as in the Bodensee, the Sea of Constance, where since 1954, 300 towns, the people of 300 towns have owned the water and managed it, I don't think that we're going to uh, uh, make the progress we need because patronage and vested interest, which you call politics, rightly, will always be there first. So let's go to audience questions. One is from uh, Reem al Haddadin from the Wana Institute. How do we create mutual interests on a regional level in a region that is infected with conflict? This is going to the policy question, as you said. How do you get out of the politics on the regional level? Well, once again, I, I think that um, the regional issues have never been sufficiently articulated to build trust. And um, I would suggest that maybe articulating regional uh, issues is to bear in mind what um, Finland did so successfully since uh, 2011. Uh, they started a, a Helsinki uh, citizens process whereby the Baltic countries and their neighboring Central European countries uh, uh, deserved and got a commission for the regions uh, devised by the European Union. And in that sense, they don't need uh, to personalize issues as we do. I mean, the minute you start talking about improving relations with Iran or improving relations with Israel or improving relations with Saudi Arabia, you irritate somebody and, uh, and please somebody. This disjudgmental attitude of public opinion is uh, basically a, a, a very difficult, diff difficult burden to be carrying at the same time as trying to manage. And this is why I think uh, that in terms of the regional information base, I mean, I've lived through data in the 70s, which became called, which was called informatics 20 years later, which is now industry four. And essentially you have to have a, a, a keen awareness of what the French call an aménagement de territoire in terms of uh, 
the managing and the, uh, and the administration of, of regions for the purposes that, for which they are intended. So, but if we continue to destroy our environment by pushing roads and pipelines through areas that need the greater attention to social participation, such as Desert Tech, which we were talking about decades ago, to bring sunshine from the Gulf across North Africa, desalinating water as we go in marginalized communities, rather than bringing hydrocarbons from uh, the Gulf uh, simply to sell them here and there. How can we optimize the value of our earth minerals, of uh, uh, agriculture, but most importantly, optimize the value and the return on our human capital? That's the basic question, I think. Related to that, Henry Lee from ADC Energy asks, what are the principal strategies to prepare for the accelerating global transition from petroleum-based resources to renewable energy? Is there a special role for Jordan? Is there a, a special impact that Jordan can have in that challenge? Well, uh, I'd just like to point out that in terms of blue peace, this Mumbai Strategic Foresight Group, uh, supported by the Swiss Agency and the Swedish International Development Corporation, uh, were managing an initiative which was transported uh, to our region in 2018 and has become the first regionally owned water cooperation mechanism in the history of the region, with Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and Iran represented. And uh, in Baghdad, uh, only a couple of months ago, I addressed a, a conference uh, speaking about the uh, Tigris-Euphrates Basin. Now we're talking about the Nile Basin, not very successfully, I'm sad to say, but we're talking about uh, a basin approach, uh, which I would like to see in the Rift Valley. And in terms of Blue Peace, it's now moving into the Green Blue Peace concept, a water and energy community. And I would like to say that also across lines, there is a lot of interest that I hear from time to time from Echo Peace Middle East, uh, environmentalists from Jordan, Israel, and Palestine who, would, who are trying to work against all odds from all sides, uh, because after all, uh, settler colonialization has meant that uh, the water table has been affected, the water table that the uh, Palestinians uh, derive their livelihood from. And uh, a regional water and energy community, uh, of course, is uh, still uh, debated by the different conflicting projects. I mean, I think southern Lebanon is waiting for tankers to bring oil uh, from Iran to give them electricity. And then at the same time, you find um, discussions between Egypt, uh, Iraq, and, and, and Jordan. So the different sources of power have to be addressed. And I'd like to say to uh, the participant who asked the question, what's particularly interesting in the report that I referred to earlier, the green-blue deal for the Middle East, was the contention that although both Palestinian and Israeli, Israeli negotiators link water to sovereignty and borders and water quantities needed of refugees and, central, uh, and settlements, this is the beautiful line, the fungible nature of water as a resource where technical, technological advances have altered the very rationale for why water was considered a final status issue in the first place, means that water quantities can be agreed upon in a manner which takes into account complexities and still represents agreement to full Palestinian water rights. Water is a human right. This is a development that we have to uh, recognize. And uh, I hope that uh, a critical uh, mass of initiatives, including the World Bank, uh, most recently the ebb and flow, could maybe lead to a, a World Bank, Bank Trust Fund um, uh, someday where we can talk about linking uh, uh, far-flung regions uh, to one another. In, uh, and so uh, I hope that that's enough of an answer. Yes, but, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Tony Mahilski, uh, director for Panbuck, asks your thoughts on opportunities and challenges for the Middle East and North Africa from multilateral cooperation, or sorry, collaboration to confront climate change. And is there a leadership role in that for Jordan? 
Well, I think that Jordan can act as a catalyst and possibly as a, as a thought provoker and a convener. But um, I, I always take the um, uh, inspiration from uh, the ASEAN region, which according to Pascal Lamy a few years ago is probably the most successful example of cooperation, despite the heterogeneity of regime types, which of course you have in this part of the world, and a kind of connectedness which stays clear of the interference which in West Asia has so often consumed our attention. And I think that in terms of uh, um, the possibility of, of, of progress, um, I, I think that um, the meetings to which I've been invited, which have been canceled twice, um, uh, conducted by Oxford University on uh, oil policies in the region and the offshoot of oil policies in terms of the uh, corporate world is something that uh, should be taken more seriously. In fact, what we seem to need in terms of uh, Jordan's impartiality in a sense, but also dependence, deep dependence in another sense, is an ability to turn uh, uh, Jordan as a, a country that understands uh, and, 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 and is qualified uh, to make the necessary pro progress. We're uh, a semi-arid to arid climate, and uh, we are on the uh, periphery. And I'll just tell you that years ago, I visited uh, Japan, met Shintaro Abe, and uh, he was still a, a member of, uh, of the Japanese diet, and uh, or had just become one of the leading figure in his party. And he said, well, we understand that you're part of a Western zone of influence. And I said, well, that is very true historically. But I've been asked by the, that Western zone of influence to look for Japanese support because we are also a hinterland country. And the Levant that I'm talking about is the hinterland to oil. If the hinterland is unstable, if the quality of its manpower is unreliable, then that has an immediate effect. But if, on the other hand, uh, we can talk about the hinterland complementing in what I call intra-independence, I respect your identity and you respect mine, regardless of whether you're stronger or weaker, and we work together on regional commons, that is the trick, I think. So we worked work very hard and uh, uh, for a very long period of time to achieve this understanding. Maybe it'll achieve in my, my lifetime or in later years, the main thing is that we've shown the seeds of better understanding of the, of the present and the future. Is there a U.S. role that needs to be played that isn't played correctly, is being played inadequately? I mean, you're, you're talking to at least partially a Washington audience today. Uh, there's been a lot of commentary about the U.S. view of the Middle East and how it's changing. Is there something that, that, that Washington needs to hear and take away from your, from your views? Well, let me put it this way. I was talking to the issue of mental health today. I mean, you know, we hear about trauma and uh, the, the, the returnees from uh, war zones and so forth. And God knows we have had our own and, uh, in every aspect. I mean, I went to New Zealand to visit after the mosque was um, attacked with the people of prayer in 2018, I believe it was. And uh, I asked them, what about trauma? Oh, they said, uh, motor accidents. And I said, no, shooting and uh, bombs and whatever. And we established some form of um, uh, cooperation. The UK and the US, unfortunately, do not want to get involved in issues relating to uh, trauma. That is to say, the official uh, uh, programs. And I think that that is a, a crying shame, because whether it's climate change, drought or urban li livability, if you will. The United States knows all of these different uh, um, forms of stress with the fires that you faced, with the uh, drought conditions that might be invited by climate change and, uh, and, and the suffering of crops. I would suggest that global warming of 2% is global warming. It's not Californian warming or uh, Arizonan warming. It is governed by the arid lands uh, cooperation. And I remember years ago sending a couple of Bedouin to New Mexico 
and the local paper said Arab terrorists arrive in New Mexico. And I said, well, can you or the USAID help us produce a, a short film? And we produced a film called um, uh, Potatoes Without Borders. <laughs> and here were these uh, Arabs in their towel heads or whatever derogatory statement is made about them. And uh, their corresponding American Mexican with their enormous hats working together on producing uh, potatoes. So I think that we have to cut the cackle and get down to actually working together if we want to build a better future for our youth. We've gotten a couple of questions, one from Rula Attar and one from Faris Latar uh, about corruption. Uh, Rula asked, to what extent can really development take off and be sustainable in the absence of good accountable governance and the vast prevalence of entrenched corruption in the Middle East, North Africa region. What can we do to enhance governance? And Fadis Latar asks, given that you have rising citizen distrust and decision-making centers in government exacerbated during COVID, how can you reduce this feeling of distrust to get positive input from fellow citizens? How do you change that part of the relationship? Well, I, I had the opportunity of working with Transparency International and Transparency Extractive in, uh, Industry International, which deals with minerals. And um, in terms of actually bringing the uh, chickens home to roost, it's very difficult for me to comment, given the fact that, I mean, with all due respect to the two who asked me the question, you, you don't have the basic handicap of carrying a title which I have had all my life. So I don't want to, uh, it's not in the best interest of you or I for me to rock the boat and to become the uh, champion of um, a, a lost cause. Um, and I say it's a lost cause because everything that we do in terms of corruption is to judge uh, from a distance or to take judgmental attitudes towards uh, uh, a particular section of uh, society or whatever. I think that the accountability of the legal system simply has to come into, uh, uh, into play. And the judiciary have to develop a better understanding of what is expected of them uh, if uh, we are going to address the subject of the, the law addressing uh, cases of corruption. But let me also describe corruption as poor governance. And that is where I uh, really worry that um, in terms of, for example, I work with the intellectual property organization and I can't tell you whether the Lacoste uh, crocodile is on the left or on the right. Uh, in terms of the sweatshops I saw, however, I said to uh, my colleagues in the IPO, um, can't you help um, bring some of these uh, products online and recognize the fact that you are creating employment instead of um, uh, looking at um, the, the, the very narrow returns of, of excluding them. The same applies to plants, of course, and we've had a uh, run-in with uh, uh, the help of Bandana Shiva from India, who deals with over 400 plants that have been taken out of uh, uh, South Asia and uh, brand names assigned to them by uh, international pharmaceutical uh, uh, agencies. And of course, it's very difficult to talk about a regional role in a tiny country. But when you're talking about regional wheat and the uh, drought in uh, Syria, and you see all the wheat seeds going to Svalbard, the uh, famous uh, uh, reserve the, in, in, in the frozen north for a day when Syria might come back online and Syrian seeds would be uh, uh, used. You wonder whether literally the lifeblood of uh, agriculture as we know it in this, uh, in this region is uh, being spirited away and in return for what? As we've seen in uh, certain parts of West Asia and, and Central Asia, is drugs going to be the new phenomenon? So uh, corruption is, um, is, is obviously there and in different forms, but I think we, should, we, we, we need to sit down and have a, a, a solid uh, conversation on the spillover of instability in the region 
the new rich, the war, the war rich, if you will, and uh, many of these issues which are cross-cutting even in terms of an American audience. And, and the other component of that, Maurice Australia asks uh, about how you gather high-level political will. There's a corruption problem. There's a political will problem. There's a. a, I agree. a how do, how do you how do you begin to build a political conversation that creates either an imperative or even a pathway toward uh, toward different distribution of resources like that? Well, I mean, you're addressing me and saying, how do you, John? I would say, how do you also correspondingly, because it's, it's you and I together that can uh, address this issue. Uh, it's you and the think tank of community that can uh, move from recommending and reflecting uh, to actually proposing that uh, maybe cooperation can be considered. Let me give you an example. When the late Sheriff Basuni, who was one of the founders of the International C Criminal Court, invited us to uh, Syracuse in Sicily, there was a participation from uh, uh, judges from different parts of the world, many parts of the United States and so forth. And the issues, of course, between what I would call a mature institutional perception of corruption were discussed in a mature institutional manner. When corruption was uh, uh, believed to be uh, a criticism, if there was what I would call an empty vessel, uh, someone who couldn't hold water or advance an, an issue simply because he didn't have the institutional depth, then obviously it was a non-conversation. And I think uh, we see those non-conversations even in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, because either you have a, a system of laws or you don't. And therefore, taking people out of the blue and presenting them to The Hague Criminal Court, you sometimes wonder what, the, what, what, what is going on. So, I mean, the, we need a toolbox, an idiot-proof toolbox of understanding what it is that we're talking about. And I go back to the earlier question about uh, corruption. And uh, say we need uh, citizens' advice based on that toolbox. Because, uh, I mean, are we relating it to human deprivation, which means that corruption is depriving uh, people? I mean, you, the, the, in the UK, they have a human deprivation index, for example. Does corruption lead to human deprivation of basic needs? Is it corruption in terms of um, uh, dog eat dog in, 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 in you know, I all, I've always said the problem with the rat race is that the rats are winning. <laughs> well, the fact that they are winning, winning presumably means a certain form of corruption. But um, uh, I, I honestly think that the way to begin is to have solid, um, accountable conversations between respectable universities, think tanks, chambers of commerce and industry and so forth. I mean, we produced, who are we? I mean, a, a group of us thinking about the issues of ethics in religion. We produced a, a document uh, a few years ago out of Oxford, no, out of St. George's House, Windsor, uh, where um, uh, believers of different faiths, I think we were nine faith groups, came up with a code of ethics in industry. So, I mean, either there is an ethical approach to industry or there is not. If we want to talk about weapons of mass destruction, chemical and biological, are they ethically approved? Or do they have a, a, a corruption tag uh, to them in the sense of the broader picture? So this is a, a very interesting subject that I don't think it should be um, pushed under the carpet. No, and, and if I may, I mean, this is this was a central theme in, in sustainable state yes. of how do you create trust? And, and in these daily encounters between people and government services, is there a way to, to build a, a different pattern of, of relations? Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. We're running out of time, but but there is an interesting question from Ian Stewart from the Royal Scientific Society. What's the role of science in reimagining or revitalizing political narratives in the region? Does science provide a way to come from outside the equation and change the equation in a really positive way? The visit I, I made to one of our uh, labs quite recently indicated to me clearly 
that when empowered and enabled, the young people from the different universities in Jordan can participate in a, I'm sorry, my grandchildren are banging on the window that they want to come and say hello to grandpa. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to dissuade them. Anyway, uh, the, the um, participation in this exercise was uh, thrilling for me because here are the young people from different parts of the country, not there because of their um, uh, belonging to this family or that family who didn't know anyone uh, apart from recognizing their universities and working in uh, scientific experiments. They even got me to put on a blue robe or a white robe or something and to fill a test tube with something or other, which I have no clue what I did, but apparently I did something scientifically important. And these are kids who are actually going to produce um, uh, copyright or uh, refereed papers in international, the international community. And this is where we, I, I feel that enabling people scientifically is one aspect of the great uh, scientific debate. But coming up with medical solutions, which uh, don't necessarily concern people, they don't feel no sense of achievement, is uh, not necessarily making stakeholders. So I think that the best approach for uh, uh, true stakeholding is empirical fact to start with, and then empirical fact to continue in the different levels of participation, whichever uh, uh, profession, professional approach is required. A scientific and a professional uh, um, a barometer is required to know exactly what our universities are doing. And if they're not doing something relevant, why shouldn't they be doing something else? Science is not a profit-making exercise. Your Royal Highness, thank you very much for honoring us uh, with your wisdom today. Again, I, I would encourage our, our audience, we can download Sustainable States from the CSS website. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Your Royal Highness, for joining thank us. Thank you. We forward to seeing and, you. And John, may I remind also your viewers of the importance of winning the human race. Perfect. Thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much. Have a good day. Thank you very All much. All the very best to you, sir. All the best.